So in this section, we're going to look at um, the hypothesis of continental drift and the theory of plate tectonics. And before we do that, I want to take a minute to review the terms of theory, hypothesis, and law. So we have our own way of using those words in our common language that don't necessarily reflect what they actually mean in science. So in science, a hypothesis, we talked about that many times, right, in your whole career in science. A hypothesis is that educated guess, the emphasis on educated, not just a random guess, but a, some, an idea that's based off of evidence that's been collected. Um, and it usually, it is trying to make sense of something. The theory is where we've collected lots of evidence. We're not collecting, we've not found any evidence to refute what we're thinking it is true, um, but we can't actually replicate what's going on. And so we can't prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt because we can't actually make it happen. So for in this example, plate tectonics is a theory because we can't actually make another planet with a hot core and a molten mantle and you know, crustal plates that move around and all of that. We can't do that. We can model it. We can make computer models. We could make actual physical models of it. Um, and we can demonstrate what's going on. But we can't actually make another planet. And so um, plate tectonics will always be a theory. It's never going to be a law because we can't do that. Laws are something like our gas laws or the laws of thermodynamics where we can prove, we can make it happen in a lab. We can show that same process over and over and over again. And we know without a doubt that this is true. So um, there's there's a little bit differences between the between them. And we're going to start out with a hypothesis of continental drift, which is kind of what got the ball rolling. And then later we'll talk about um, what that what it actually turned into. So Alfred Wagner was the gentleman who came up with the idea of continental drift or this hypothesis. He's not the only one who noticed some of these things, um, especially as pieces of evidence. He built on the work of other scholars. He looked at some of the old map makers. He looked at um, work that geologists did. He looked at work that Charles Darwin did when he was out on the Beagle. He looked at when he was collecting plant samples and things like that. He looked at a lot of other people's work and he just kind of synthesized it. He pulled it all in together. He was an explorer and a naturalist, but he wasn't a geologist. So he had this idea that all our continents were together and he called that one supercontinent Pangaea and that's what's pictured here. So you'll notice that the continents don't necessarily look exactly like they do now. Some of them are a little bit squished and a little bit out of place in here, but you can see where they, they really do look like they would fit together. Um, there are structures on the ocean floor that we'll talk about later on that mirror the, the joints of the continents, particularly as you go up here, this way, that make us think that this is the way the continents would have tipped and, and fitted together. He called the large ocean area Panthalassa. So he thought, you know, all the continents were together, which means all the, the oceans were together. And he came, he came up with four really good pieces of evidence of why he thought this was true, um, but he was missing something. And we'll talk in a minute about what he was missing and why his hypothesis never became a theory. So this, were, this is his evidence um, for, for continental drift. And like I said, he got a lot of this from looking at other people's stuff. So we talked about the coastlines. A moment ago when we we're looking at the pictures. But as he, I'll come back to that in one second, um, as he was looking at this, where these areas and some of these areas like right around in here and around the horn here in South, this part here of South America where it meets in with Africa and then also down in this area, down in India, another little bit up in here, what he was finding was similar fossils. He was finding the fossils of plants and animals that there's no way that they could have gotten to where they are today unless the continents were touching. There was no way that two species would evolve identically millions of years ago with that much water in between them. We've seen in our, just from what goes on now, um, that speciation happens when there's that much distance in between. They start to, species start to adapt to the situation that they're in and it starts to change them. And so if they're that separated apart, then they're not going to be the same. We've got squirrels in Arizona, the Mount Graham squirrel and the Kaibab squirrel that were at once the same species. But because our climate has changed, 
we now have what they call mountain islands. Okay, so the, the taller mountains are the only places these squirrels can live and up around the north rim. And so because they've been separated for a long, so long, they actually became two separate species where if they, they couldn't make little squirrels anymore. And that's one of the things that it means to be a different species. And so if that can happen in our current time frame, within the amount of time that we've, we've been around and studying all this kind of stuff, it's definitely going to happen over millions of years. So there's no way that the animals could have swum across the ocean or flown across the ocean or anything like that. There was no way for them to get from one area to the other and to be there in, in those prevalent, that amount of um, quantity and that quantity of, of specimens that they were finding. So by a similar token, in, in a lot of areas, what they were finding is that the rocks were the same. So they were finding it looked like a mountain range would start on one continent and looked like it ended on another continent. And the rock layers were the same and the rock ages were the same. Um, and once again, no way that could have happened unless the mountain formed and then the continent split apart and broke that mountain chain apart. And the last piece of evidence is about climate patterns. So what I mean here is that um, we have evidence that the climate in a particular area was vastly different than what it is now. So for example, in Antarctica, there's coal beds. So coal, in order to form, has to have a moist and wet environment. Coal, coal beds predominantly come from really old swamps, ancient swamps that got buried under sediment over time and compressed down until it became coal. So Antarctica is frozen and is sitting under many, many feet of ice. And there's no way that swamps are going to form there. So if there's coal there, which there is, then that means that one of two things has to be true. That the South Pole, one, the South Pole either wasn't cold, as cold as it is now, or that Antarctica wasn't at the South Pole. One of those two things has to be true because the coal beds are there. Well. For our first option, that the South Pole wasn't always cold, we orbit the sun in a set pattern, and that pattern really hasn't changed. We might, our ellipse or our oval that we go around the sun maybe get, gets a little bit longer every 24,000 years, but it doesn't, the Earth doesn't tip on its axis. We are, we've been at 23 and a half degrees or so. Um, of magnetic declination, which means we're tipped just a little bit on our axis, but the South Pole wasn't at the equator ever. So, because of the way we go around the sun, the sun hits the equator most directly. And that means that it's hottest at the equator and the sun doesn't hit the poles very directly, which means it's colder there. And because the poles were never facing the sun, it means that it wasn't warmer at the poles. So that's something that hasn't changed for us. There's no evidence of the fact that the planet turned 90 degrees. So if that's not true, if it's not true that the poles weren't always cold, then it has to mean that, that Antarctica wasn't always at the poles in order for there to be cold there. And what, they're, what the common idea is that um, Antarctica was up around where India is now, in, in between India and Australia, up closer to the equator in order for it to have that kind of vegetation in the quantities that were required to have the coal beds that are there now. So he had all these bits and pieces of evidence, but what he really didn't understand was how. So imagine this, imagine in the early 1900s, I want you to put your mind first in the time frame. So it's over 100 years ago, right? Um, very few people have automobiles. Um, Nobody's been up in an airplane. People have been up in hot air balloons, but not very many people because they're expensive and they're kind of rare. So the only way you're going to see the ground from above is if you climb a mountain, which isn't going to give you necessarily the same kind of aerial view as what you get from an airplane. So nobody's really ever seen it from above. Not very many people have seen the under the you know down towards the bottom of the ocean, and nobody's seen anything off of the continental shelves. So diving bells have been around, little diving suits, think like back to your Scooby-Doo days, 
when Scooby Doo and Shaggy would go underwater in the in the diving bell, right? And they have this big big heavy suit on with the big bubbly hat kind of a thing. That's what they were using, um, and they couldn't go down very far. Like they could go down 50, 100 feet or so, and that was about all the water pressure that they could tolerate. So they're not going very far off the continental shelf at all. So you've got kind of a limited view. Most people haven't been very, very far from home. Um, and when Alfred Wagner was speaking about his ideas, he was speaking to a scientific community um, that they were supposedly the specialists in this area, and he was not. So he lacked some of the qualifications in their mind to actually be right. But he also couldn't tell them how. So he's telling them, this, all these learned people, he's like, look at all this stuff that I found and that other people have looked at and look at what this means. This means that the continents are moving. And they thought he was nuts because they looked at him and like, the continents aren't moving. You can't feel them moving, right? But they're moving really, really slow. But he couldn't tell them how it was happening. He didn't know how. And so that was kind of the big downfall for him. That's the thing that he was missing was that mechanism for movement or how are the, con the continents moving. He had a few different ideas about maybe earthquakes move them or maybe, you know, some other things move them, but he really couldn't come up with that definitive why. And that's why his was a hypothesis. Um, and later on, it wasn't until the 1960s that he was actually proven right. And so he actually died with everybody thinking he was crazy, which is unfortunate. It wasn't until about 40 years after he died that um, he was proven right. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture.